Today we're going to talk about how to create portraits and why portraits are important and look at some portraits over the course of history. Um, portraits have been around for a very, very, very long time. So why do people create portraits? They want to record um, something about their experience in their life. They want to show importance. Um, they want to show, kind of take a snapshot of the time. But remember, cameras have not always been in existence. Cameras were invented around the time of the Civil War in the 1860s. So we have some portraits that have been around for a very long time. This is one of the most famous portraits in history from ancient Egypt. This is the death mask. Uh, on the sarcophagus or coffin of King Tut. And this mask was the layer right next to his mummy, and that is why it is so fancy with the gold and the semi-precious stones, the lapis lazuli. Um, portraits of the old times, just like today, when we are taking portraits at a family event, a wedding, a quinceanera, uh, when you take your senior portraits, we do not generally wear our everyday clothes. We dress up for those special occasions, just like King Tut was um, dressed up in gold and lapis lazuli so he could enjoy luxury in his afterlife. So the clothes that people are wearing in their portraits are often representative of their everyday, not their everyday clothes, but their fancy um, their fancy clothes and their fancy life. The first portrait, this portrait, is um, from a very famous building that was created during the Renaissance and it's by a famous Renaissance artist. Some of you have probably heard of him, Michelangelo. And this is the face of God um, in half of the painting that illustrated the creation story from the Bible. And this is God the face of God, okay? Um, next, we have another famous Renaissance artist. This is a portrait, a self-portrait by another famous artist, Leonardo da Vinci, as a younger man. Many of you might recognize this famous portrait also by Leonardo da Vinci. This is Mona Lisa. And it's probably one of the best known paintings of all time. And it is actually quite small. So in real life, it is about the size of this piece of paper that is, is printed on. Um, we have another portrait by Leonardo da Vinci. This one of him as an old, himself as an old man. And he, um, as an old man, uh, went to live in France and um, was supported by the King of France and he actually died in France. Okay, This is a portrait by a famous Dutch artist, Rembrandt von Rijn. He point, painted many, many portraits throughout his life and this one he painted himself as a young man. He is best known for the strong light and shadow in his portraits. This is a portrait by a French artist who happens to be a woman. This is one of her self-portraits, and her name is uh, V.G. Lebrun, and she painted herself wearing her Sunday hat on a nice sunny day. And it is an oil painting. Our next portrait, um, some artists change styles quite a lot. And so our next portrait is by a famous artist that you may have heard of. It's a portrait, it is not a self-portrait, but it is a portrait by Pablo Picasso. This portrait is from his blue period. Um, he, one of his good friends died, and so for a period of years, he painted uh, lots of paintings with blue and gray and dark colors because he went through sort of a mourning period. 
This is a, another painting also by Picasso. And uh, Picasso is one of the artists that started Cubism. So you'll notice this painting is very simple, but we can still see that there is a portrait and half of the portrait um, the woman is facing, we see a profile or a side view, and half of the portrait is from the front view. That is one of the things that Cubism is known for. This portrait is a little bit later. It is also by Picasso, and it is also in the Cubist style, but very much more fractured and um, jagged, has many more jagged shapes, and there's a tears here. So this is called The Weeping Woman. Um, there are kind of a lot of, uh, in the old times, Paris was the center of the art world. And so there are a lot of these next couple artists that I'm going to share with you uh, whose lives overlapped. This is um, Henri Matisse, a French artist. And he his style is from um, called the Phobis. And so he overlapped a little bit with Picasso in terms of his lifetime. But the Fauvists used color emotionally. So this woman did not have a green paint on her face or green makeup on her face, but he was trying to create a mood in the portrait. Um, this is by another artist whose lifetime overlapped with Picasso, and he is an Italian artist who also lived in Paris while Picasso was living there, and his name is Amadeo Mogdigliani, and he, his signature mark was that his portraits, whether of himself or other people, have long necks and kind of long faces. That's kind of his exaggeration. In this portrait, the eyes are a little bit close together, um, this portrait is also by an artist that was living about the t earlier times of Picasso's life. And this is a detail from his a famous painting called The Scream. There were actually several other people in the portrait. But again, trying to show the expression. Monk was very influenced by uh, World War I and by um, pandemics that affected his family. And so death is represented in this picture, and that is the person screaming, being influenced by death. Um, another person who was alive and whose life overlapped with Pablo Picasso, who also met him in Paris, even though she only lived there a short time, was a very famous Mexican artist, Frida Kahlo. This is a, a self-portrait of her, and she had a very famous husband, um, Diego Rivera, a very well-known uh, Mexican artist as well. Uh, but this is Frida Kahlo. Um, our last couple artists are more contemporary. So this, some of you may recognize this movie star. This is a portrait uh, by Andy Warhol of the famous actress Marilyn Monroe. And it is done in kind of a pop art style. That is, it's... Um, a silk screen print and a photograph combined and then colored in this very interesting way. He did portraits of many other pop stars, Alvis, as well as other polit political figures as well. And um, we have a one more realistic portrait. This is by um, a Chinese American artist, Miss Chang. And it is a self-portrait, so um, very serious uh, presentation. And you'll notice her face is turned sort of in a three-quarter way. And the last portrait that I want to share with you is what we call a caricature. Some of you may have seen caricature artists at Disneyland, at the Santa Cruz Boardwalk, at Venice Beach. So caricature artists take a look at the person and make the portrait by exaggerating some facial features um, and so it's cartoon-like and that is where the word caricature comes from. Now we're going to talk a little bit about face maps. So all of these portraits generally fall into the basic face map. 
or recipe for making a portrait. So we have our basic shape, the oval. It is split in half vertically. It is split in half horizontally. So the amount of space from the top of the head to the eyes is the same or nearly the same as from the eyes to the chin. If we take the eyes to the chin and we split that space in half, that is the nose, the bottom of the nose, and that's how we get the nose line. We take the remaining space and split that in half, and that is where we have the mouth. Now, interestingly enough, the mouth is three parts, this little part between our nose and our upper lip and our two lips. And then we have, again, space between our lower lip and our chin. Some people's chin is more oval and some is more circular, but we'll talk about that next. Um, and our ears line up with our eyes and nose in this space, and our neck also lines up with our eyes here. Okay, so we'll talk more about that um, in our next part. So now we're going to take a look at some of our artists, our famous portraits, and see how they did with the face map. So let's take a look. Here is Mona Lisa, and let's take a look at the basic shape of her head. And that is the oval. Okay? So we have our oval. Okay? Now let's take a look. Her head is slightly turned, but we're going to split her face. There's half. And let's check out this. If we have from her eyes to her chin and her eyes to the top of her head, it's about the same. Let's go ahead and split halfway. That's the eye line. Half, half. Okay. Let's take our, where is the bottom of the nose? Half half. Where is the bottom of the lips? Half, half. Okay, so Mona Lisa follows our pattern. Let's take Mr. Mogdiliani's portrait. Let's do the oval shape. So the shape, and it's a little tricky because we have hair here on the beard. So there's our oval shape. Where's the center of the face? Okay, his hair, hair face is turned slightly. Let's look at where the eyes are, where the nose is, where the lips are, and let's check that out. Okay, so here are the eye, is the eye line. It's to the top of the head. It's about equal. How about the nose? From the eyes to the nose is the same as the nose to the chin. Half and half. From the lips, from the nose to the bottom of the lip is the same as from the bottom of the lip to the chin. Okay, so we go half, and then take that space, split it in half, that space, split it in half. So half, half, half. Okay? All right, and the last portrait we're going to look at, this way is the portrait by Mr. Matisse, the woman with the green stripe. So there's our oval shape. Get that a little darker there. All right, let's split 
Split it in half down the center. Okay, so now we've split it in half. Now let's check out the eye line. Generally, we go through the center of the eye, the bottom of the nose, the bottom of the lips. Okay, so let's check that out. From the eye line to the top of the head, let's do this one first. Eye line to the chin. There's one half. Okay, and her hair is a little taller because she's got a bun sitting on top of her head. Her hair is up in a bun. Okay, so that one checks out. Okay, from eyes to chin, halfway, let's take that half, nose to nose, that checks out. So half and half, and then this half, the nose to the bottom of the lips should be the same as the bottom of the chin. Okay, and you'll notice that I've been using my fingers to measure. I use the ruler to draw the lines, but I want you to use your fingers as the measuring tool. We are not using the ruler to say, oh, it's three inches by four inches, okay? All right, so um, that's all the portraits we're gonna look at by dividing with lines, but it's important to understand that um, all artists use those same proportions, okay? All right. Now we're going to create part one of our step, or our face map, okay? So to get our oval shape, the first thing that we're going to do is turn our paper on our side. Now, while we're drawing our face map, it's important that we don't draw tight. I want to draw from my shoulder, so I might even, or you might even want to stand up. Okay, so for all of you out there who are in sports, it's like throwing a ball. You have to have follow through. So I'm not drawing down here. I'm drawing with my whole arm. And so before I start with my pencil, I'm going to use my finger to sort of pre-draw until I feel like I've got a good kind of pattern going. It's like I'm rehearsing for this. And... I might even need to make a couple of lines to get a good oval. Okay, now if that's going to bug you, once you have practiced, then it's okay to make one line. But probably you're going to want to make several. Okay? And I like this one better, so we'll use this one. Okay, so um, our next step is we're going to split this in half. So I'm looking at my oval. And now I'm going to use the ruler. I don't want the lines to be too dark. Okay. And I'm going to take my oval and split it in half. And I'm not using my ruler. I'm going to... Practice with my fingers first to try to get a sense of where I think the center is and I might even want to make a little mark. And then I'm going to use my fingers to measure. It should be equal. And that's pretty good. So now that I've checked that out, I will go ahead and make my line across. Let's label this our eye line. Now we're going to take the space from this line to the bottom. See where it is in half? It's We're dividing this space in half. One, two. I'm checking to make sure with my fingers that it's equal. And it's in the middle. If it is, and my dot's in the right place, I will go ahead and make the line. It's much easier to erase a dot than it is to erase a line. Now I have to place the lips. 
So I'm taking this space. Oh, let's label this first. This is the nose line. Now we're going to space the lips. So we're taking the remaining space here. We're going to divide it in half. I'm going to use my fingers to check to make sure that it is equal. And this is the lip line. Okay, now the last line that I have to draw is I have to mark the hairline. You'll notice that this is the top of the head, the top of the head, the top of the head. Okay, so our hair does not start up here. So it starts here. So we're going to take this space, the length of the nose, And we're going to take this space and divide it in half. I'll put a little dot, but before I draw my line, I want to use my fingers to check to make sure that it's in the right place. And I'm going to make it a lighter line just so I know that these are the features of the face and this is just a reminder of where the hair is going to start. Let's go ahead and label that. Okay, and so for next, for before the next class period, on your eight and a half by 11, your printer paper, I want you to draw your oval, and I want you to make this much of the face map. So the oval, the center line, the eye line, that is, halfway between the top and the bottom, taking the eye line space and the chin space, dividing that in half. Okay, so this is the same as that, and then dividing that in half again. So we have half, a quarter, and an eighth. Okay. And lastly, remember, we're also going to mark the hairline. So from the eye line to the top of the head, this is also a half, so that's going to be at one quarter. Okay? All right. We'll see you next time.